Okay, today we are uh, near to the, uh, the end of the, of the letter uh, concerning the different uh, semantic uh, work topics uh, and uh, we try to discuss uh, uh, a bit about reasoning. When I first heard about, uh, many years ago, about uh, the fact that you could uh, do reasoning uh, over the ontologies, over the semantics, uh, I was somewhat uh, excited, saying, okay, good, I can you know, uh, describe knowledge and have the machine reply to me with some uh, new information. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, what, uh, what we can do with the semantic web reasoning is not so fancy, it's not so exciting, uh, because of the many limitations, many of, of the algorithms that we can use. Uh, so, uh, reasoning uh, uh, is a nice word uh, if you are a journalist, uh, but uh, to, so to, uh, today we try to, to understand what it means uh, or what can be done uh, in the context of the semantic web. Uh, first of all, I, I'd like to spend some time in general talking about automatic reasoning. Mm -hmm. so maybe you could be already familiar with that or not, uh, but we'll try to set some common ground about what happens uh, in a very simple way uh, with uh, reasoners, not tools uh, that do some uh, formal reasoning. And then we'll see uh, how the designers of the OWS standard uh, um, tackled the, the complexity of, uh, uh, of reasoning by defining several profiles, so making life more complex for any one of us, uh, creating dialects uh, of OWL that behave differently when you try to reason over text. Hmm? And, uh, but that was needed because the general uh, language was not reasonable at all. Hmm? And uh, uh, at, at that point we, we understand uh, a bit more uh, how, what kind of reasoning tasks we could uh, expect, uh, we could uh, use uh, using description logics. Uh, description logics is one of the semantic models of one of the dialects of OWL. We will come to that in more detail and see, okay, with that kind of logic, what kind of question would you ask? And we'll see that with, not, with, with many other profiles of, of, of the OWL, the kind of question you, can, you may ask are really simpler, simpler. And with description logics, it becomes more, more powerful, but even... Uh, so we learn what kind of question to ask and uh, how to try to ask them in potential for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and the final point is uh, uh, a language, SWRL, Semantic Web Rule Language, uh, which is a language for writing your own systems of inference, actually. For writing your own set of rules that will be applied, that will be creating your own reasoner with your own uh, criteria, with your own rules, uh, that fits your application requirements. So we'll see that at a given point we, we split hmm, and we say, okay, are we trying to reason about our knowledge base with the description logic semantics or with a custom application semantics? Are we using the standard reasoner and try to pull some information out of the DL reasoner? Or are we constructing a set of rules on our own that are more, you know, um, uh, designed for digging the information that we want and adding that back into the ontology. Of course, they are not uh, um, ex mutual, mutually exclusive, these two ways, but there are different ways of thinking of, on how to pull information out of the ontology. Um, okay, so this is the fast for today. So, okay, intuitively, reasoning is trying to derive implied information starting from explicit information. So in um, ontology modeling, uh, we try to model explicitly what are the characteristics of the domain uh, that we are interested in. And uh, uh, we saw that with RDF, the only thing we could do is was to state facts. With ontologies, we state facts, but uh, uh, we, we are using some relationships, for example, subclass, 
or type that already have some meaning, some semantics to the language. And this means that some additional facts may be derived that are already implied by the facts that we are stating, the axioms, and the rule of the language, and the semantics of the language. So if we combine the axioms that we write, so the facts, the statements, and the behavior of the, or the meaning, the semantics of the subclass and type uh, uh, relationships, then hmm, we can say that uh, there is some implicit fact, so a fact that is true, but is not explicitly listed in the knowledge base. Hmm. This is one simple way of putting uh, the reasoning task. I have a set of known facts, uh, actions, I have a set of uh, rules that describe how the language behaves, what is the meaning of the relationships and, or, or, and of maybe some main class. And then, by putting together the axioms and the rules, I can derive new information. Of course, a reasoning system is sound and consistent if the facts that can be derived by the reasoners are true. Okay, I can write my own reasoning system which doesn't follow the rules of logic, for example. It can derive mechanically some conclusions that are not true, that are not consistent uh, with, the, with the initial data. If I'm writing my own, my own set of rules, that this is one risk. If I'm using uh, an existing set of rules or an existing reasoner, no, I trust okay, that uh, and no false impl implications can be done. Uh, so, we are, we are describing a task that can be automated mm -hmm. by a tool, a reasoning engine or a reason reasoners, if you call them. And uh, the task of these tools are to add the new information, infer new information. Mm -hmm. We are still in the semantic web domain, so every new information is always added. We add information, we never remove, uh, we never restrict uh, uh, previous information by adding new facts and new axioms. Okay? The open word assumption still holds, uh, so the reader can only descri uh, discover new truths, new, new facts that we assume to be true, uh, and can never retract an existing one. You can never say, okay, your action, your, 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 um, your statement is false. Mm -hmm. So it can either add new information or discover that the whole model is inconsistent. Mm? And so it cannot derive anything at all. Um, this is the general task. Of course, there are many algorithms uh, for accomplishing this task. Okay? Uh, depending on the kind of rules, depending on the complexity that we have, depending on the, the size of the knowledge base, uh, we can apply different types of algorithms. And they sold the, the literature on, uh, say, on theoretical computer science is filled with uh, new types of algorithms uh, that are more or less suitable for that kind of logic uh, representation or not. Okay? Uh, we, we will use a more tool-oriented approach, uh, and so we won't uh, we go inside too much inside these algorithms. And in particular, we are uh, focusing on uh, rules-based reasoning. For two reasons, we are focusing on this kind of algorithm. So one is, that, of course, uh, the semantic web rule language uses rules, so we need to understand how it works. And second, uh, the kind of uh, description logic reasoner that we use in OWL uh, is compatible with a rule-based implementation. So actually, this is the sort of the main way to go mm, uh, as far as the, the uh, reasoning algorithms uh, are concerned uh, in the semantic web. So, what is a rule system? How, how does rules uh, uh, based reasoning work? Actually, the reasoner, so the task of the reasoner, is to apply, to discover and apply a set of rules to the knowledge base. When we use the term knowledge base, I mean classes and instances. Okay, so the T box. Uh, and the air box, the terminology box, classes, subclasses, relationships, restrictions, and so on, plus all the instances. So we have the whole ontology. Mm -hmm. um, so 
in the semantic web, a knowledge base is represented by an ontology, plus maybe other important ontologies to that, that combines all the classes, all the definitions, and all the instances that have been uh, asserted, so all the actions that have been asserted in the knowledge base. And so we have this full list, the full content of the ontology, and a list of rules. Every rule is uh, in a form, loosely, of a if-then format. So a rule has a, a condition and a conclusion, an antecedent and a consequence. So uh, the condition is a sort of a query that says that if some statement is present or some combination of statement is present in the knowledge base somewhere, then the rule is activated. And activating the rule means uh, adding to the knowledge base the conclusion means that also the conclusion is true if we assume that the knowledge base is true and this rule is consistent then the fact that we find into the knowledge base the pattern consisting uh, corresponding to the condition means that also the pattern of statement uh, corresponding to the conclusion must also be true. And so, if it's true, yeah, under the same assumptions that we had, we might also want to add it back to the knowledge base. We might. Huh? It's not, uh, we are not forced to do it. We just discover new information. If we want, we can add the, that information back to the same knowledge base. So actually, what we find at the conclusion can be, <laughs> if we are not very lucky, can be one factor which was already known, it may happen, we apply a rule and we, we find uh, that the output is something that was already stated somewhere else in the ontology. Okay. But in some cases we discover new facts, new information. And, um, of course, this is a very general uh, description and we already understand that uh, if, if we try to imagine an algorithm, we need to repeat the same task over and over again because every time uh, okay we have a rule first of all the condition part of the rule might match in many parts many parts many statements of the ontology imagine that the condition could be a sort of a spark query so that match is it's a bit more high level but uh, as part of your what you have the relationship with question marks uh, and say, okay, is there any pattern like this and that? And the language in which we can write these kind of patterns may be more or less complex depending on the type of logic we are trying to read. Mm -hmm. So every rule can identify more than one place, more than one condition to be true. And then you can add some conclusions that usually mean adding new facts, adding new relationships. After you add the conclusions, probably adding some conclusion will trigger new rules, so we will make the condition of other rules to be true, because you are adding something to the knowledge base, so you may add something that will trigger one pattern of another condition of another rule. So actually, it, it's a process that you can repeat until no more rules uh, have a matching condition in your in your knowledge base at that point you finished at that point you finished uh, if the user universe doesn't finish, finish before you because uh, it may happen that the number of rules the number of consequences that you can draw from a given knowledge base can be enormous mm -hmm. and uh, and so the task of the algorithm is not just being able to apply the rule but having a good strategy for applying the minimum number of rules uh, in order to get the information that you want. Mm -hmm. So it's not just an open reasoning, but in some many cases it's reasoning with a goal. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is some example, very stupid, uh, of uh, rules. In this, these kind of rules are actually not needed. It will not. It will, it's not something that we would write, uh, but they would be part of a reasoner that understands OWL. So these are parts, uh, these are rules that are part of the semantics of OWL. 
the first one is sort of saying that the, um, the subject, the domain of subclass should be a class. And uh, uh, the instance of this class, of a subclass, are also instances of, a, of the superclass. Okay? So inheritance of uh, uh, type relationships. The second one is uh, class two, is a subclass of one, and class three is a class of two, is the condition. And then it means that class three is also a, 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 a one, a class one because uh, it's a subclass uh, of a subclass of class one mm -hmm. and so on so these are rules that describe the semantics of uh, subclass and, and type which are the basic constructs in, uh, in OWL in RDXP in this case mm -hmm. so we learn the, uh, the meaning of subclass, the meaning of type uh, from a let's say, theoretical point of view we understand what it means to Declare a subclass. But for the reasoner to understand that, actually the meaning of the statement must be translated into a set of rules to apply uh, that show how to discover new, potentially new knowledge, because maybe this was already there, uh, into the knowledge base. This is a very simple type of, um, of rules. They are the form clauses, in some cases they are called. Um, if then, and the if condition is a conjunction of patterns, an end. Mm? Uh, depending on the language, you can may also have a or, you may also have a not. Uh, and actually, you get the rule system which match more powerful semantics depending on the kind of conditions that you can write. Mm? The conclusions are not so important because if you have a very complex condition you can also you, you can always write many many different rules each with a different part of the condition that you want to get so the, the important part the intelligence stands in the condition part of the rules not in the conclusion and so we have made the simplest reasoning system that only uses uh, conjunctions conjunctive rules rules where in the condition you can only use the end operator or also these jumping rules where in the precondition we can also use uh, the OR operator this or that implies something or negation the absence of something or the false state of something implies mm -hmm. a conclusion um, negation is not possible in the semantic web because it's against uh, the open word assumption you can never say in the semantic web that something does not exist because there might be always be some place where that exact factor is asserted so negation would be forbidden from any reasoning system that is consistent with other people it's a pity because you can never say that some information is not found because the language does not allow you to say, okay, if it's not found, then it's, uh, uh, for example, if a student is not enrolled in our, uh, in our anthology, if a student is not enrolled in any course, then he's uh, an inactive student. You cannot write that this in, in, uh, in OWL because uh, the fact that there is no relationship that links to that specific student to any course doesn't mean semantically that the student will not be enrolled in any course if the knowledge base was larger hmm? um, another way of saying that is that adding information can never make something become false when it was true by actor, if we were able to write a rule that defines the uh, inactive student, okay, the status of this inactive student, you are inactive, for example, may be true now. But if I add some new factor, the fact that you are enrolled in a course, 
then the fact that you were an student becomes false, would become false. And so we are adding new facts, uh, and the consequence of adding new facts would be to retract some truth. Something that was true is no longer true. This is not acceptable in the semantic web. Uh, we don't want that. We, want, we always want uh, truth to be monotonically increasing. So we never say that something is true unless we are sure that it cannot, it can never be made false by adding any kind of other information. So this is why it's uncomfortable, but <laughs> this is the, uh, the reason why the negation is not possible. Also, this junction, this junction will be useful, actually, really, and it doesn't violate the negation part. The problem with the, this junction is that then you have different ways of getting to the same result. And it makes the reasoning algorithm much more complex. Mm -hmm. Instead of just iterating rules uh, and matching uh, like queries or the conjunctive part, the disjunction of one, two, three, four terms, uh, you can have the query that looks for one part or the other or the other. Uh, uh, and uh, so the, the, the reasoning algorithm should be a branching recursive algorithm rather than just a, an iterative uh, application. And it means that the complexity of this algorithm will go to the non-polynomial space. Non -polynomial space. Mm -hmm. So actually, conjunctive rules can be reasoned under some condition. In polynomial time, disjunctive rules cannot be reasoned in general in polynomial time. That's why the designers of OWL wanted to remain uh, in the reasonably complex uh, domain and so they only allow you, usually, mm, in the, with, the, with the main language that are supported, to conjunct the rules. Mm. This is not a theoretical reason, it's mainly an efficient reason, an efficient, efficient reason uh, to, to, to forbid, in many cases, the disjunctive rules. And by the way, you don't have the not, so you cannot construct a nor using an end and the more rules mm, of logic. So, there are. You are actually limiting yourself in the kind of expressive facts. You are writing rules uh, that are weaker than Boolean logic, than first order logic. Hmm? Okay, so uh, as I said before, uh, we may have a reasoner that applies sets of rules, and in some cases, some sets of rules are already predefined. So, for example, there are a set of rules that define the other of semantics. Of the OLD is one language, the set of rules are already known to the reasoner. So, we can just ask the reasoner to reason the ontology using other of semantics or description of semantics, which are quite equivalent in our sub case, some in, our, uh, in the domain in which you are working. And so, the reasoner already knows what to do. And who wrote those rules, the set of rules, uh, made the right thing of, of uh, writing the rules that are equivalent to the semantics of OWL. So this is the simple use case. Of course, we can only learn new information if that is implied by the explicit information, the existing rules that we have uh, expressed in the ontology. Otherwise, we can, otherwise or better, in addition to that, we can create our own set of rules. Additional rules that are not just implied by the OWS semantics, but in some way are implied by our describing our knowledge of the world. So we can have some knowledge about the domain that we can encode into rules, and maybe that kind of knowledge cannot uh, be described directly in OWL something especially related to the individuals, because all the, you know, in OWL, all the properties you can define are always properties or restrictions at the class level. If you want to add down something, some operation at the instance level, the individual level, it's very hard. It's a, you just, you, you would have to create a class with only one individual to do something with that individual. Uh, but by writing rules, actually, you can work easily at the individual level. And it's the, the goal of the semantic rule language. So, 
we have a set of known facts in the knowledge base, a set of rules that follow some kind of limited syntax, limited uh, uh, restrictions, and we want to apply this rule to the knowledge base. So, uh, from the algorithm point of view, we have uh, two different or two main approaches then for the algorithms. Uh, always mix uh, the real algorithm always mix the different approaches but just to understand mm -hmm. um, applying the rules could be uh, done by a forward chain uh, algorithm what do i mean uh, imagine we have this uh, knowledge base in the left uh, and fact one and two are known facts already explicit in the ontology then there may be a rule that from fact one you can infer fact number three. And once you have fact number three, you can infer fact number four, because there will be another rule and so on. So, you start from the known facts uh, and try to match all the available rules, in some order probably, to the uh, available facts. And then, when you discover new information, you can add it to the knowledge base, which is called intelligence, so implications of the known facts that become explicit. Fact 3 was already true, but we didn't know it. Now we know it because it's being made explicit thanks to the application of an intelligent rule, and so on. And so maybe today we are starting from fact 1, reasoning the ontology, and uh, uh, this is the full set of uh, new facts that we get. And the reasoning stops when there are no uh, rules that can be applied anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, it runs until it stops. The algorithm just applies rules. It doesn't have a direction where to go. It doesn't know what to discover. The, the algorithm goes to, like in breadcrust shirt. No? You are starting from a point and expanding expanding, expanding, until you find something. You can only stop when there's nothing more to find. Okay? There is a good uh, property of this uh, forward uh, chain uh, reasoning, is that you can add new facts to the knowledge base, and uh, adding a new fact, for example 6, uh, cannot, by definition, make the old entanglement false. They were true, they are still true if I am adding new facts. So, in some way, this kind of reasoning is robust. I can, at the same time, reason on the ontology and get new information. Of course, if I have new information in the knowledge base, the reasoning system can start again. For example, fact of 8 was implied by fact 2, but was not implied by fact 2 alone. Only by knowing also fact 7 that depends on 6 that we just added. So we added 6 and the reasoner can start over. So whenever we add something, the reasoner can start over and find new, new facts. And so the the message here is that the result of the previous reasoning are still valid, are still embedded into the new reasoning with these new increased facts. So, forward chaining is a heavy algorithm because it needs to compute everything, but uh, it can be done incrementally. You can start reasoning over a subset of the knowledge base, then you can add some facts, uh, and you reason the implication of adding that fact. Uh, it could also be a strategy for the algorithm, not taking the knowledge base, uh, the complete knowledge base at uh, the beginning, starting uh, with a small part, uh, reason over it, uh, find a fixed point of the reasoning, add some facts, uh, restart the reasoning, and so on, so that incrementally we are building the complete model. And by chance, we could find that fact number 10 is true. And maybe there is something that is interesting to us. Maybe. So at the end of the reasoning, we can query 
in some way the uh, reasoned ontology, the ontology with all the reasoning conclusions in it, and check whether some given fact that we are interested in is true or not, is implied or not. Sorry. Is true or not known? Hmm. I cannot say not true because it's not that we have So Sorry. We can check whether a fact has become true, has become known to be true, or has not become known to be true. It doesn't mean it's false. I cannot say it's false. How does it one approach? Simple, simple to understand, simple to implement, not very efficient probably. Uh, there will be a problem in the algorithm, but we don't go into that, if we try to remove some fact. So removing a fact is potentially destructive because uh, you, it's not so easy to find which other facts uh, need to be removed uh, that, that are not true any longer if you remove some of the uh, explicit facts. So usually when you remove something, the reason usually starts from scratch because it's easier to start from scratch than, than understanding the implication of that argument. Well, because it, this picture is misleading because we have only very few facts. It looks like fact A, it uh, depends on two. But uh, the fact is that the reasoner discovered A starting from two. There may be another way of discovering A starting from six, uh, applying another rule. So I cannot say that if I remove two, then A is no longer true. Because there may be another rule that will bring out A again. Hmm? So uh, it's more ironical increasing when you add facts, uh, when you remove facts. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not easy no, to, to understand what, needs, what entailments fail to be true. Okay, but hopefully we are not uh, removing facts uh, so uh, every so often. The other way is the backward, backward uh, uh, chaining or goal-oriented reasoning. In backward chaining, what you're doing is uh, you start from the conclusion. So you want to know whether fact 10 is true or not. That's, that's your approach. You, I want to ask the reasoner whether this fact is true or not. Is true or cannot be proven true currently. Hmm? And so the reasoner could work uh, backwards Say, okay, fact number 10. Are there any rules where fact number 10 can be a conclusion to the rules? So we are not looking at the, at the, um, at the condition of the rules, rather at the conclusion. Okay, there is this rule where fact 10 could be the conclusion. So if there is, what kind of uh, condition should be met? And so I can construct fact number 8 that's saying that, okay, if fact number 8 were true, then fact 10 would also be true. And so what are, what are my options for finding fact 8 to be true? And are uh, the rules, uh, of course, you need a lot of fact tracking, right? a lot of trial and error, by trying different ways in which a fact can be made true by applying by making it a consequence of a rule whose uh, antecedents, or whose conditions are not known yet. So you are making up facts that you don't know, don't know whether these facts that you're making up are true or not. You just try. If by chance 8 is true, then I, will, I can prove that 10 is also true. And so backward train, chain, try to, to find a way back from the goal of the reasoning back to the explicit facts. So if, if they can find a tree of uh, entailments, of implications, or rule, of rules that justify the fact that you know back into the terms of the basic known facts, then this is true. So it doesn't need to construct a whole set of known facts or a whole set of implied facts. Only that part of the 
tree or, uh, that is needed to justify their specific single file. Single file. Of course, there are a lot of uh, strategies that should work uh, in order to find efficiently a good way, because otherwise you're just uh, uh, making intermediate hypotheses. Huh? What you're doing here is that my hypothesis that is that if eight is true, then ten is true. Then you move on trying to prove that eight is true or whether it is true. And I say eight is true. Okay, I see that two is already known. So if I change one to seven, it will be true. Then eight will be true too. And so you move to the hypothesis that seven will be true or not, and so on. So you are making. A, a, a branching tree of hypotheses, and you need a clever algorithm in order to pursue those hypotheses that are more likely to succeed. Otherwise, you are getting lost in some in the, the nowhere land of, uh, of hypotheses that will never bring you to the, to the path. Hmm? So, a lot depends on, on good heuristics and good strategies for the for the algorithms. But if the algorithm is good, then it can. Uh, save a lot of time compared to building the whole uh, system. Of course, this backward chaining is a fact answering algorithm. So if you want to, to check whether another information is true, for example, we knew that fact number five was true, so we start with five, usually you have to start from stretch. Because this whole tree only leads to ten. It's not, it doesn't contain the full implications of all the rules. These are just temporary truths that you're used for proving the truth of them. So if you are asking a second question, you start again. It's not, you cannot do that in an incremental way. You cannot say this and hope that it can be useful for another query. Hmm? Um, and so it's more for querying ones. So if we if we have an ontology and we know that the ontology must be queried many, many times, then we become more efficient to try to do a full reasoning, forward chaining of the ontology, and then every fact uh, that can be proven true is explicitly listed in the knowledge base. And so querying this ontology is trivial. Asking questions just means checking wh whether is there a fact there or not. Is that individual linked with the other individual with the property? Yes or no. So if something is true, it's there. Just it's listed there. I have a long list of things that are known to be true, and whenever some statement is not in the list, then it cannot be proven to be true, true under the assumption of the original. So all the information that we could extract is already there. So it becomes efficient if we want uh, to... If the knowledge base is quite stable, it may be large, I don't care too much, but if it's stable and they need to be used many times, uh, it's worthwhile to, to do the reasoning at the beginning. By the way, this kind of reasoning is also what you are doing uh, for consistency check. So when you are doing ontology, we saw last time that you, you use the original tool to consistency checking to check whether there are any inconsistencies or, or bad classes there. Or, um, and so you are, you are actually already doing that. Hmm? It's part of design of the ontology. Only for very large domains, uh, this can be used. Um, okay. So this is the world of infinity. It's quite blind, I would say. Okay? A blind algorithm that has a bunch of rules, a long list of facts, and try to match the rules with the facts, uh, hoping to find something new. Hmm? Um, there's, so there's no intelligence in that. The intelligence is all in the creator of the rules. Creating the right rules will make the algorithm extract good information. Hmm? So we go back, this was in general for any kind of original task, especially rule-based. Going back to OWL, what, what are what, uh, what are the rules hmm? used to reason on 
all uh, OWL look like. Um, well, of course, these are mathematical problems, theoretical problems of ensuring that what we write in OWL does actually have a semantics, a mathematical semantics. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, in, uh, when the design of OWL actually defines two different semantics for the OWL language. One is called the direct semantics and the other is the RDF semantics. The RDF semantics is the simpler one and stems from the semantics of RDF. There are a set of rules that can be applied on the RDF representation of an ontology that describe fully all the implication, all the implications that can be derived from uh, the um, from the OWL semantics. The direct semantics is more high level and uh, applies rules uh, according to higher level concepts like belonging to a class, uh, like belonging to a relationship, and so on. Which of course can be expressed in RDF, but maybe the uh, uh, linking to items in the relationship may require more than one RDF point. Uh, and the uh, some constructs in, uh, in, at the OWL level are one construct that will map uh, to several structures. And so a higher level semantic working directly on the OWL construct and not in, on the RDF uh, triples is also defined. Of course, these two semantics have been, have been proven to be uh, equivalent, mm -hmm. so we can use uh, uh, what we want. Uh, the simplest one, the stupidest one, is the RDF based semantics. Uh, in this sense, under the semantics, we can say that OWL is an extension of RDF. It is a very dangerous thing. Means that every RDF graph is also an OWL, is also an OWL, under the semantics. Okay? Because the reasoning rules under the RDF semantics of OWL are an extension of the reasoning rules for RDF and RDF schema. Why is this uh, dangerous? Because in RDF we have no limits about what we can say. In OWL we learn, in ontology design, we learn to draw a, a, a distinction, draw a very thin line that separates the classes from the instances. What we say about the classes, what we say about the instances. Okay? We forbid ourselves to think a class, to think of um, one of the first uh, uh, things that we learned that when doing ontology is that a given I arrive, or you arrive, um, represents either a class or an individual, never both. So it can be the subject of a style statement, or it can be the object of a style statement, but can never both be both. Okay? No resource in ontologies can be a class and an individual at the same time. In RDF, there is no such restriction. There are just triples. And so, under the RDF semantics, uh, it would be allowed to have classes that contain uh, individuals, but the same, uh, I cannot say the same class, the same resource, the same IR, the same URI, is also an instance of another class. There will not be a class anymore. Uh, you are creating classes containing resources that are also classes. It's not a union class, a class that contains an object which is also a class. Sort of a recursive multi-set. Okay, this is something that you can do in RDF and also in uh, uh, under in OWL under the RDF basically. 
This kind of, uh, of uh, description is uh, called usually OWL pool. So we are the most complex semantics, more complex means with less limitation, of the uh, of the ontology, where we can also model very complex things. So you can do phylogeny with OWL pool. Huh? Thinking the idea how the idea of the MI or something like that huh? can be done. Good, very expressive. The bad part is that OW pool is not decidable. So there is no known algorithm that in a finite amount of time can reason over an OW pool ontology. In general, the complexity of uh, OWL pool means OWL with the, with the RDF based semantics uh, is uh, not critical. It's not a matter of being exponential or the exponential or exponential. No. There is no known algorithm that is known to terminate. Hmm? Because the set of rules uh, would generate an, in, an infinite amount uh, of other classes or classes of classes of classes, classes. So we are starting, uh, you know how, how natural numbers are defined in the, in the basic of mathematics. Uh, the zero is a uh, empty set, and then number one is a set containing zero, and number two is a set containing one, which is a set containing zero, and so on. Oh, actually, mathematically, all the integral numbers are sets that contain other sets. Okay, and we have a CV here, a language that allows a class to be an element of another class. This means that we have if you have a rule that allows that, automatically the rule can generate an infinite number of different of that because it likes the, the natural numbers. How many natural numbers do we have? A counter, counter countable infinite. Okay, so, and there's no way of limiting that because there's no way of saying, okay, I will stop at 10,000 <laughs> because maybe you need one more to prove that something is true. So there is no complete reasoning algorithm that is able to finish in a finite amount of time. Maybe you are lucky, of course. Maybe you apply only three rules and you find your true. But the general reasoning cannot be done. So that is why people tend to stay away from OWL full or use OWL full only when your goal is descriptive. Describing but never reason about that. Never query about that. It's only formalize some complex stuff using an ontology so we try to limit it and we try to uh, accept only a subset of rules even if we know uh, that uh, uh, at that point the ontology will have some limitations we can under the direct semantics we cannot have all the freedom as an object so in this case, we don't look at the RDF statements anymore. We are looking at the other real concepts that are classes and individuals. So if we are already talk talking about classes and individuals, we are already making the separation that RDF doesn't allow. And so we are, from the language point of view, uh, forb forbidding the problem. You cannot express the problems if you are talking about class and individual. You cannot create such paradox in prototype. Because you know the individuals and the classes are very separate. You cannot mix them, you cannot compute them. And so, of course, we need uh, another set of rules uh, that are compatible with that. And uh, um, this subset of OWL that doesn't have all the problems of OWL pool. It's called uh, uh, usually OWL DL. Well, DL stands for, for description logic, and we'll see a bit more, more uh, about that in, in a minute. So actually, what, what they did, what the OWL designer did, was try to identify which is the largest subset of statements in OWL 
that are still decidable and decided to to forbid only those kind of statements uh, that would make the language uh, not decidable itself. So out of the, the, the DL is the best effort of something that can be as much expressible as possible while still having known decidable algorithm. So we can actually reason about that. Then with more or less efficiency, let's see. But at least we know that it's decidable, so there are finite time, exponential, but finite time algorithms for deciding the truth of a statement uh, if we limit it uh, to OWLDL. And for doing that, we, they grounded, huh? they linked the meaning of the RDF statements, uh, for the OW statements, into the description logic, the L uh, format, huh? the mathematical forming of description logics. So actually, uh, under this subset of the OWL pool, we are working on a formal system that is equivalent to description logic. And this is good because, not for us, because probably we don't know anything about the L, but uh, there are also theoretical results that will help uh, the tool developers uh, theoretical results about the L. Hmm? And uh, what is description logic? Just a flash, a roll flash. Description logic is uh, a subset of first order logic. Hmm? Uh, first order logic is uh, Boolean logic plus quantifiers uh, existent for all and so on. And so description logic uh, is uh, uh, defined by a set of uh, operators that work on, let's call them sets, uh, for example. So that look like intersection, union of sets, uh, complement, uh, enumeration, so construction of sets by... Uh, we already recognize many of the uh, constructs uh, that we have in OWL, of course, because OWL was built with this in mind. Okay, so this is one, the idea of building a class by enumerating the items, or building a class by intersection, uh, subclass of the intersection of many other classes. Uh, and uh, minimum and maximum cardinality, the existence of a property that leads to a class, or for all the, the, the element, uh, the, 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 the corresponding class is in C, and so on. So there are different uh, syntax, syntactic ways of expressing that. No? This is a mathematical formula. You can, you can do algebra with this, okay? with these operators. And, um, plus uh, some actions, axioms, sorry, that state uh, uh, some, some meaning, some property of the different classes. Uh, for example, uh, the axioms that uh, define how subclass, uh, how identity, how disjointness and so on work. Mm -hmm. So, this is just, uh, we say, Mathematics. On top of this mathematics, uh, they defined uh, the rules uh, of reasoning. This is just a, a flash. The full list of reasoning rules uh, for the script uh, It's not uh, not something we can read because there are a lot of uh, other assumptions in that. And but uh, you see that there are. Uh, 15 rules or something like that that can be applied over and over again and these rules are always if if there is something and something else then you can add this if and then you can add this and so on so these are, are written in mathematical terms instead of RDF but uh, we can recognize uh, a rule-based system. Mm -hmm. So, in the mathematical world, you can describe these uh, description logic statements, starting from individuals, properties, P, and then building classes by joining individuals, properties, and so on, 
and then you can reason apply these rules to infer other known uh, facts until everything can be implied everything can be entailed so it's just of changing formulae switching from mathematical formulae to rdf statements so the rdf language and we are in the domain of OWL. So what OWL, OWL, DL restriction logic does is to implement map one by one of the mathematical operators of the system logic into the OWL language. And so embed the reasoners will embed that set of rules, of course, translated in the in our format. And this is decidable. This set of rules is decidable. Decidable doesn't, doesn't mean efficient, doesn't mean convenient, means decidable from a theoretical point of view. And uh, uh, that's why OLWL is the widest subset of, of OWL that can be written, but it can become very heavy to reason about. Therefore, again, the designers of the OWL try to define some subset of DL that were easier to reason. And they defined three different, they call them profiles. OWL, EL, QL, RL. And uh, the way is, uh, the method that they use uh, is uh, more or less the same. They restrict the usage of a language. So, for writing something to the EL profiles, which we have a look at uh, these three profiles in a minute, then you are forbidden from using some statements of other people. So if you are only using a subset of statements, and then you are inside this. So, if you are reading RDF in general, with all the freedom, you are in other people. If you are using the old other statements, like you did in Protege 3, or the same without intention, you are creating a DL description as a description logic. If you are careful and try to avoid some statements, maybe what you are defining is an EL or a QL or an RL um, dialect profile. And if you are in one of these profiles, some simpler and faster reasoning algorithms may be applied. So these again, again are the widest possible language subset for which a given algorithm is able to work. No, is able to work. And in many cases it can be more efficient. So we are trading off some expressive power for having some computational benefits. I know I cannot model that kind of relationship. Okay, I, will, I, know, I have knowledge base that is more stupid because it's doesn't express an information that I know to be true, but uh, it will be much faster to query. And uh, unfortunately, the situation is this. OWL pool, description logic, and inside description logic, we have the three dialects that overlap in all the possible ways. So there is no clean, there isn't a ladder saying, okay, step one, step two, step three, it becomes more complex. Uh, R, Q, and E are not compared to each other, they're not, they're not contained into uh, each other. Huh? They are different beasts. And uh, it, it's, it's complex, actually, hmm? because it's complex to understand wh where should I go in that picture uh, without uh, learning a lot about all the formats that are behind. Hmm? It's not a developer-friendly situation when you know, okay, you can select the language you want, because it's easy to understand the, the differences. Uh, they're not very easy to understand. Mm. Actually, what they say is that EL, the E of EL stands for existential quantification. And uh, this is a dialect uh, where that enables polynomial time arguments for most reasoning tasks. So you can do forward chaining in polynomial time, not exponentially. Of course, it limits uh, the, the language a lot, but it can be used where you need very large uh, ontologies. So 
for example, there are you know all the biomedical ontologies where you have all the gene information, the illness information about and so on, and you're linking them in the ontology form. These tend to be very shallow uh, ontologies. There are not many properties, not many implications, but a lot of classes. A hierarchy of classes, a lot of relationships, a lot of individuals, that they can be very large, but the modeling is not very complex. Mm -hmm. So you don't have uh, very complex properties or very complex restrictions, logical restrictions to model. Mm -hmm. But they are large. So it's very important to be able to efficiently mm -hmm. query on that. It's a sort of a, a very powerful storage of information. Uh, QL has a different goal. Say, okay, but we already have a way, <coughs> put it this way, of uh, applying a rule system. For example, in SQL, in database, we have triggers. And what is a trigger if it's a rule? Something with some precondition when in a table you find this data, then make an insert instead, for example, and add new data somewhere else. So there might be a subset of OWL that can be implemented by triggers. Or maybe not a simple trigger because that would be not much very efficient, but a technology equivalent to the technology that is currently empowering triggers. receivers. So QL stands for query language because uh, it's very efficient no, this subset or the language can be quit very efficiently using uh, uh, database tools actually or database technology currently current database technologies it means you don't need to understand or oh, the tools that need to understand rdf uh, or subclasses or so on but just having a set of uh, very simple to apply rules hmm? and um, it actually can reply in logarithmic time so special so in this in this case, uh, when we have uh, when we are using ontologies to store a lot of individuals, so EL is good for having a lot of classes, QL is good for having a lot of individuals, and the queries would be very simple usually. And then we have the the third profile, which is the more complex one. Well, I cannot say more complex because they they are not contained; they overlap. But, um, probably the biggest one of the three and the R stands for rules and it contains the language construct the biggest subset of language construct that enable the polynomial time execution of a rule-based reasoning system so VL was already reasonable by could be written by a rule based system the issue is that uh, the time was not polynomial was the complexity was decidable with an exponential complexity and rl is a subset of the L where a rule based system can get a result in a polynomial time so of course, it's not as expressive as DL, something uh, is forbidden. But uh, if you want to do some uh, reasoning, real reasoning, with, uh, by applying rules, uh, you should probably use uh, this profile. Hmm? Where you can use rules, rules are, in general, can be more powerful than triggers, hmm? uh, but uh, they are not so complex uh, to. Uh, go into the um, non polynomial uh, domain. So these are, the, from the complexity point of view, we have these different profiles OWL pool, description logic, EL, RI, QL. And this, uh, the, the y axis is complexity. So actually, we have one barrier, or the barrier of decidability, this blue one. Above this barrier, no, you cannot do any reasoning no, in finite time. 
he, uh, below this barrier everything is decidable in the middle section in exponential time and in the lower section in polynomial time so this is the um, the say, a sort of a, a picture where that compares the different uh, complexity hmm? okay um, just to have a flavor oh, without going to the full definition just to have a flavor of what is what are these three profiles uh, I said the three profiles they are uh, limitations of the L so something is forbidden you, you cannot express something and of course, you gain the uh, computability by uh, refraining from using uh, some characteristics. So EL, we say that uh, are, is thought for ontologies with many, many classes. So the word classification mainly classes. Mm -hmm. um, so we have, you have all the, most of the statements for working with classes. So restrictions, cardinal restrictions, um, existential quantifiers, and so on, can at the class level can be used because you want to create your own taxonomy of classes. Um, you can use property expressions, also property chaining, mm, to create chains of expression, except. Except, uh, for example, there is one strange thing is that the inverse property is not allowed. We use that in our modeling. Uh, also, of course, if the inverse property also the role in the course and stuff like that, uh, it cannot be stable. You can, of course, create the two different uh, uh, properties that go in the, the two directions, define their domains, their ranges, and so on, but you cannot say that they are the inverse of each other. So the reasoner will not be able to infer uh, that belong in the uh, and uh, it's a limitation you cannot have negation hmm? uh, but this is fair normal you cannot have disjunction or union hmm? you know that you have the union statement you cannot use it here universal quantification properties you can use uh, some you cannot use all in your restriction your property restriction restriction hmm? Uh, some elements from yes all elements from are is forbidden uh, it, it may seem strange why cannot we use that oh okay i can, cannot reply unless we go to the mathematical, mathematical level and and, uh, and see uh, what are the complications of uh, adding these uh, constants you from the syntax point of view you know that, that those are forbidden and uh, this is the full list uh, taken from the, from the definition of the, of the different uh, statement that you can use uh, subclass, equivalent, disjoint, subproperty but we are not supported, for example, object all values from minimum cardinality, maximum cardinality, complement of which is the negation, you know, is forbidden uh, one of, data one of, disjoint prop data property, disjoint object property so everything that has to do with the or and the not <laughs> has been deleted of course symmetric property a symmetric property also because you, you cannot talk about the, the inverse property so you cannot define whether it's symmetric or not because you, you can you you're not able to go back and and so on you can have uh, functional properties but not inverse functional properties so these are the, are the limitation of the year ql is uh, you remember the trigger based profile uh, actually is uh, more or less mm, gives you more than the same language the same expressive power as you have it with the ER diagram relationship diagram or UNL uh, class diagram when you can have express classes relationships and people inheritance but you, if you think about that, you cannot have uh, uh, a restriction on properties. No? Uh, you can make, make in a class diagram in UML or an ER diagram in your database, you can have a subclass, but the subclass may have additional properties, but cannot there's no way the language is not restricted property of a subclass. Mm -hmm. 
So this is why we have a sort of asymmetry in the class action that you can restrict something in the subclass, but you cannot touch anything that was defined as a separate class level. So you can restrict something for yourself, but not for the, the, the property that you are inheriting. So it's some part of inheritance in some way. Um, and uh, and uh, you have a lot of limitations uh, on the quantification of the roles of the belonging. So, you know, when, when you're doing an ER diagram, you only talk about minimum maximum cardinalities. You, can have, you cannot express uh, logical constraints to be part of the relationship. And this cannot be done here also. So, this is the, again the formal part, which is a lot of uh, uh, more. Uh, these are the forbidden constructs here. We, and here we have uh, the allowed constructs, but they are constrained. Mm -hmm. Constrained with, the, uh, with a, a limited way of creating classes. Okay. I, I pasted this in this small font because we don't, we don't, I don't want to read that. Uh, but just to have the idea of how it's defined, uh, you, we can create subclasses in some way and superclasses in some other ways, but not in all the possible ways that the, uh, the OWL language would allow us. No? Usually in OWL you could create a subclass uh, si simply by making some restriction over unrelated classes and that would define a class implicitly. Mm -hmm. uh, here it cannot be done because you can only, I, can, I can only create a class explicitly or with intersection or negation. I can use not here. Negation can be done. Mm -hmm. uh, or extension quantification to a class or data range. That's it. So not the for all, I should have the for all, I should have uh, um, logical constraints to, to build classes. And the uh, rule language profile, uh, it says, I, will, I still want to do reasoning, I just don't want to be exponential in time. So I have uh, uh, something that uh, is as powerful as possible that can be still treated by a rule-based system using only conjunction rules. We already saw that. Uh, we, we are deleting the OR in the rules for gaining the polynomial time. We said conjunction disjunctive and negation rules at the beginning. The negation rules we delete immediately because they are not compatible with the open the open word assignment. But this junction rule would be an option. In the description logic, you can have this, uh, this junction rules. But that leads to the exponential time of the algorithm. It will forbid also the disjunctive rules. So we take only the conjunctive rules, so we can only have an end in the preconditions. Uh, then you can have a polynomial time uh, reasoning. Um, so uh, with this, uh, there are very few limitations compared to DL. So RL is not much more limited than DL. Um, there are all, all some statements where you can say that an individual an individual in a class implies that another individual should be in a class or should exist at all. Uh, which is some say corner cases that cannot be expressed. And uh, you see that the definition is also smaller. So we are taking away less from DL in order to build RL. So RL is actually much closer to DL than the other profiles. And um, mainly the constraints are uh, a limited way of creating classes at the subclass level or the superclass level, uh, which are not complete, but uh, it actually is a uh, intersection complement uh, all that is from, so extension uh, Universal quantification, maximum cardinality. You don't have minimum cardinality, for example, mm -hmm. uh, because the there was existence. You have universal, but not existence. They are different uh, profiles. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. So this sort of was the, the, the general. Um, general picture. 
there's a lot of that we don't understand. No. We know that there are some definitions. We understand that behind each of the definitions, there's a lot of mathematics that we don't know and we don't care to use. And what we want to do next is uh, how, uh, to understand how can we apply all of this theory uh, to our ontologies. What can we do with our ontologies? Uh, and so what kind of reasoning we can do, I would say, with description logic in general, because we know that it's desirable, or with LL, the rule-based description logic, which is a subset of the L, which is just faster to, to, to reason, but the conceptually uh, it, it's not different. And uh, um, maybe it's a good point to, to make a break before, before going to more say, uh, concrete tasks. Uh, we'll see how, what kind of tasks are supported by the concept of description logic and then how we can, some of them, not all of them, unfortunately, are also supported by our tools, by Protege and uh, the region and stuff. Hmm? So maybe we can take 15 minutes, 20 minutes, break. Yeah, it's already on. It's just